So Thursday night, around 10 o'clock, I got a phone call from my dad. I didn't pick it up because I was looking at my phone at 10 o'clock. And uh, he ended up falling asleep before I got to talk to him. So Friday morning, I wake up, I pick up my phone, and I call my dad. And my dad says, you know, good morning, son. How are you doing? Because that's how my dad talks. And I'm like, hey, dad, what do you want? And he's like, well, I want to know, are you coming this weekend for Mother's Day? And my reaction to him was, oh, right. Right, it's Mother's Day. And that also played into me saying, oh, I need to talk about Mother's Day. I need to talk about Mother's Day for Sabbath. I need to talk about Mother's Day. I need to do a couple of different things to get ready for Mother's Day. Mother's Day is a very interesting holiday. It can be, honestly, one of the most diverse uh, holidays to people because, one, it's great for mothers. Um, it's stressful for husbands in many ways because of expectations to do. It's like Valentine's Day, um, but lower on expectations. But it can be really painful for people who have never had a child or were never able to become a mother when they really wanted to. And having this day where we're like, hey, mothers, we're talking about the greatness of mothers, and there's people that are in the room that never got that opportunity. Uh, or there's some that wanted the joy of having a mother, but they wanted to do it with a spouse, and that spouse is no longer present in their life. And what was going to be a blessing in their life turned out to be something that is more stressful and more taxing and sacrificing on their life than they intended. It's tough to be a mother. I wouldn't know, obviously. Uh, but it's something that there's a reason why we created a holiday to celebrate the life and the willingness and sacrifice that mothers give. Today, I want to talk about mothers. I want to look at the story in the Bible. It's, a, it's an interesting story, in my opinion, but it has a lot to say about women, about mothers, and what we can learn about how to be a good mother. Um, so, let's start off with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get straight into the story. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for Sabbath, and I thank you for this opportunity to speak. I pray, Father, that you be with us, may your Holy Spirit be present, and teach us new things on this Mother's Day weekend. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today's story is going to take place in 1 Samuel. We're going to be looking at the story of Hannah. And some of you may be saying, Pastor Jason, didn't you just say you're going to talk about good mothers? You just mentioned Hannah. Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking about Hannah because there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot to grasp on how Hannah's a good mother. Some of you may already know the story of Hannah. And there's some things of what Hannah chooses to do primarily at the end that is a struggle for some of us. But I want to talk about it and how we can apply it to our lives that's practical and is safe and healthy. So, let's start off with 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we're just going to start in verse 1. We're going to read through this chapter. We're going to stop at different places and see what we can learn about this story. So, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Now there was a certain man of... Ramathen Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zeph, of Zuf, sorry, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children. But Hannah had no children. Okay, let's just start with this. 
Number one is that we are getting, right at the start of the book, they're giving us two key pieces. Number one is that they're talking about lineage. The main reason back then why they talked about lineage, why they would say this is the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, is because back then they can't just say in the year of 2305 BC, so-and-so did this. Because they didn't have BC and AD back then. There's no way to track that. So the only way that they would track this is to mention the lineage of people so that you had a sense of mind of the generation or the time lapse of when this took place. And it also helps with genealogy to know like this person came from a family of so-and-so. So like we know that Elihu, the son of Jeroham, uh, sorry, Jeroham was the son of Elihu, who was the son of Tohu. Like these guys go really far back, really close to the uh, like the origins of the family of uh, Joseph and his twelve brothers. Like we have a lineage that goes all the way back to the twelve because of what they wrote here. It's not a huge expanded amount of time that we get to see of what they're mentioning. So they give us that history and they tell us a little bit about when this is being placed by saying the names of people and then it mentions that Anna is the opposite of Panina and has no children. Having no children is a detriment, not just of the fact that Hannah wants a kid and can't have it, but we know that having a child back then was a sense of basically having an income or having a job. A wife's value was specifically based off of whether or not she could have a child. And then it was duplicated, multiplied, and she bore a son. Each son was like four or five times the value of a daughter in that society. And so if this, like, Penina is having children, if one of them is a son, in her societal value, she is six, seven times more valuable than Hannah. And that's just for social status, because, you know, a, a male back then was just viewed as being more significant and could do more physical work back then, so they made it more of an effort to highlight males. So Hannah, in this situation, is viewed extremely low. She can't have children, she hasn't born a son, she has no social societal value in that world. So this creates a lot of pressure for like in, in today's society, if you meet someone who, who lives with their family, has no job, and they're living there like the whole thing, like it creates this awkward scenario sometimes. But the family's like, yo, when are you gonna pick up the slack, bro? Like when are you gonna carry your own weight? When are you going to start contributing to the family? And they're like, oh, I'm sorry. I can't find a job, I can't do anything. Like this is that's what Hannah's in. Panina's, well, we're going to see it in the story, Panina's going to make fun of her. She's going to bully her of the fact that she can't have a kid. And like, it's not like she's like, it's not because I'm lazy. It's not because I'm not trying. I just can't. But it's going to, going to create some problems. Let's keep reading. Verse 3 it says, This man, which is Elkanah, this is the husband, this man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts, in Shiloh, also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Danaeus. It's fun that in the same story they have Danaeus and Penea. That's just that's just cool, man. Hophni and Phineas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Benea, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord 
closed her womb. Let's stop there. Number one, we have the priest of Eli. Again, Eli, uh, Eli is a priest. We have another one where it's mentioning Eli is mentioning his sons because it's giving us an indication of Eli and his family at that time. In the story of Samuel, and as you read through the book, uh, Eli's kids come up into the story. Samuel ends up having kids. They show up in the story. Like, they end up in the Bible. So this is a reference just of what's already existed. It's created a narrative of saying Samuel's, uh, you know, like, Samuel's not born yet. Here's Eli. Eli already has his kids. But they're creating the framework and the background of the story. And then it mentions that Elkanah comes yearly to do animal sacrifices in this specific place. This is a repetitional thing that Elkanah participates in every single year. And he mentions that he gives her double portions because he loves her. Does that mean in this story that he doesn't love Penea? Sadly, yeah. This, in this society, in this time frame, in this world, you didn't marry a person just because you love them. Sometimes you marry someone because you love them. That's what Elkanah has Hannah for because he loves her. That's why we have like the story of Jacob where he loves a, he loves a woman. He goes to his dad and asks for her, and what does the father tell her? Tell him. You gotta marry the other daughter first. Work here for seven years and then you get her to work for another seven years and get the one you want. Why? Because it's bad if the firstborn daughter gets married second. It's bad in society. So he, the father makes sure that the other daughter has the security. She has a family. She has money that's coming in. She has someone that's going to take care of her. If Jacob comes in and marries Rachel first, that other daughter loses everything. That's how the society works. So for this, when it mentions that he married Phinea, he didn't marry her because he loved her, necessarily found her attractive. There was some sort of a social societal system of something that made it that O'Connor needed, wanted, had to marry Phinea. So to say, I love Hannah, there is a legitimate matrimonial love, passion that exists there for those two, but there is not the same emotion and feeling. There, there is a favoritism. And in that society, it makes sense. Today, it doesn't. Today, we have this idea that when you get married, that you love the person, you cherish them, you care for them, you sacrifice them. You make all these different things to make sure the person that you married and the person that you love, that they feel a connection between the two of you. You're living together. Like, it matters. For them, it was not the same. So she gets double portions because it says the Lord loved her. Or because Elkanah loved her. And then it says right afterwards that the Lord closed her womb. This is an interesting piece. The Lord closed Hannah's womb. There are not very many places in the Bible where God mentions that he specifically closed the person's womb. Is there anybody in the Bible that you can think of that had their womb purposely closed? Rachel. Okay. Anyone else? Sarah. Right? Sarah was purposely closed. What about uh, in the Gospels? You've got John the Baptist's mother purposely closed until the right moment. There's, a, there's an intent by God to close the womb of really important people or to close the womb 
to reveal something about himself or to wait till the person is ready to follow God or to make that step, that leap of faith. Abraham and Sarah is a prime example. Abraham, there's a record there that for Abraham and Sarah, that Sarah's womb was closed. And then God promises it, and God, they specifically mention all of the opportunities that something bad could have happened to Sarah and didn't because God wanted to make sure that we knew that Isaac came from Abraham. And that that is the true birthright, firstborn of Abraham and Sarah. We have situations where God specifically closes the womb, but the person that comes out of it is a really important person. Isaac is a very important person for the history of the Israelites. John the Baptist prepared the way of the Lord. That's a big person. Here we're talking about Samuel. Samuel is the prophet of kings. He literally, like he was the one that went and found Saul. He's the one that found David. He's the one that was given to prophesy about He's a big deal. Sometimes we as people like to look at a person that can't have a child and say, well, it's just because God's testing them. God closed your womb so that he could reveal it at the right moment. And honestly, unless that you believe that that person is going to give birth to a prophet, I don't think that's the right answer. There's a specific reason why God closed the womb on these people. It mentions it because there's something there specific that's happening. It's not because God's just setting up a trial. God's preparing the way for something much bigger and much larger than just an individual test and causing pain to test another person. That's not what I see here. So, Let's keep going. 1 Samuel, chapter 1, verse 6. Here we have some bullying. It says, her rival, her rival is Phinea. Her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, Hannah's husband, said to her, says, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Let's be real, how many times do women have problems and men look at them like, oh, why are you crying? <laughs> right over our head, we have no clue what's going on. We have no idea what the struggle is. We just see somebody crying and say, oh, I must help, I must fix this. We have no idea how to fix it. We have no idea how to make it better. There's a problem and we're just there like, yo, why are you crying? Unfortunately for Okana, he says one of the one of the most insincere and ignorant questions, or like questions that he could have asked. He says, "Am I not better to you than ten sons?" That answer is no. <laughs> no, you're not. Okana, you are not better than ten sons. Think, think about it. As as a person, as you grow up, like. One of the things that all of us in society look forward to is, is possibly like a day where it's like, yeah, then I'm going to get married, possibly have some kids, going to have a job, going to get a house, it's going to be in this great place, I'm going to retire in this wonderful place. And we start getting these ideas of grandeur of what the future holds for us. Hannah's already married. So that like check mark of happiness in the future is set. Children are not. Therefore, husband does not equate to children, especially ten. 
It doesn't work that way. Like when we start getting excited about something or something we want, but we already possess something else, we don't want that same thing. We want something new. Hannah wants children. And she is literally getting bullied for not having children. She's not getting bullied because she has a husband. She's getting bullied for not having kids. She's getting bullied by the other person who's called her rival who has multiple sons and daughters. And she's being told every single year, every opportunity, this woman is coming up and making her life miserable. And this guy comes, like her husband just comes up and is like, yo, what's wrong? Why are you crying? Like, is he, is he not even at home? Like, is he not even paying attention? He has no idea what Hannah is going through. And so he asks, why are you crying? But I think this is a moment that a lot of us can relate to. Many of us have rivals or bullies or people in our lives that like to make our lives miserable. They like to push us down. They like to keep us low to the ground as we can so that they can stop us. It's tough. But Hannah can teach us something about what happens when we have bullies in our lives. But we got to keep reading. Verse 9, it says, So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Silo. Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forgive your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child. I will give him to the Lord all the days of my life, and no razor shall be upon his head. So, Eli is nearby. Eli sees what's happening, and the, the priest is right there, and this woman, Hannah, just prays with everything she has. All of the sadness, all the bitterness, all the, all everything that she has experienced over the past couple of years, she cries and says, God, remember me. Do not forget about me. And then you notice it says that she asks for a male child. She asks for a male because of society. It's the one thing that she wants. She says, if you give me this, I promise to give him to the Lord all the days of my life. That's a big promise. That is a huge promise to give in this moment of stress. But that's just how broken Hannah is. Hannah is so distraught by this, she's so pained, she's so grieved in her, like, lashing out moment in this, in this situation where she feels absolutely broken. When she calls out, she makes a huge promise. I will give him to the Lord all the days of my life. So, Verse 12, it says, And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put the wine away from you. All right, we, we got we, we, we to gotta deal with this one. So, because this gives us a beautiful insight to a miracle. But we have to understand something here. In the, in, previously in this story, it mentions that they went to this festival. It's an annual festival. Right? So they're in Judah, in Shiloh, having this annual festival. In the beginning of it, actually, you can see it in verse 9. It says, So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Back then, as a part of the culture, a 
as a part of the ritual every single year when they went, the feast of celebration afterwards had eating and drinking. Now, before you persecute me on saying that, notice that Eli says, how long will you be drunk? There's, it also says in a couple of different translations, it says you're still drunk. By saying that implies that Eli already knew and already anticipated people to be drunk. A priest already expected that. And then he gets to this point, it's now in the morning, it's now the next day, he sees Hannah, Hannah's praying, and she looks like he's drunk. His, his answer is not like, hey, you're drunk, what are you doing? He says, you're still drunk? How long are you going to be drunk? Put away the wine, like the party's done, go home. Don't be a drunkard. That's the problem here. The problem that Eli sees is not that the person had something to drink. The problem that he has is the problem of drunkenness. The problem of losing your conscience. The, the, the problem that leads to more problems. That's the issue he sees here. So he calls it out to her and says, what are you doing? Why are you still drunk? Why are you still doing this? Go home. Put away the wine. And Hannah in verse 15 says, she answers Eli and says, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drinks, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Before the Lord. Do not consider your maid a wicked woman. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Eli expected her to be drunk. Eli expected her to be totally intoxicated. And she comes to him and says, I'm not wicked. I'm not a drunkard. I've been talking to the Lord in clear conscience. And it's because of this, because of this moment of what Eli expected versus what's actually happening, that he was able to actually witness a miracle. He was able to actually see Hannah's prayer. He was able to see that it was something more, that there's something happening here. Her prayer is not just a person with her eyes closed, just sitting there contemplating and thinking in their mind. He sees voices, but nothing's heard. He sees this moment of something that is abnormal happening, and that's when he realizes this is something more than normal. And that's why he says in verse 17, Eli says, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. He realizes that this is no ordinary prayer, and in his own departure, prays that God grants the wish that she requested. And verse 18, she replies, he says, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, her face no longer sad. Hannah found peace. And in verse 19 and 20, it mentions that Hannah knew Elkanah, and the Lord remembered her. So then in verse 20 it says, It came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked from him, from the Lord. From the moment that Samuel was born, Hannah knew exactly what she had to do. She literally named Samuel, Because the Lord heard me. She knew that Samuel came from a divine path. A divine influence was here that allowed for Samuel to be born. And so Hannah remembers, as the Lord remembered her, she remembers her prayer, she remembers what she had said, she remembers what she promised, and plans to fulfill it. And this is where it starts to get a little difficult for us as mothers and as parents. In verse 21 it says, Now the man of Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, 
Then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So Algon, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best for you. Wait until you have him meet. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bowls, one ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought them to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here, who stood by you here, praying to the Lord. For this child I pray, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshipped the Lord there. This is the part where it gets a little difficult. Because we want to believe that a good parent is a person that looks after their child, that takes care of the child, and keeps them, trains them, mentors them, and Hannah just gave her child to Eli. It feels like bad parenting because she abandoned the child. She left the child at the doorsteps of the sanctuary and said, here, I have promised to give it to the Lord. Here you go. But there's something here that I want to make notice of. I mentioned before, at the closing of the womb, that there's a similarity to other stories where Jesus, or where God closes the womb of women to reveal something special, something ordinary. And one of the examples was Abraham. What did God call Abraham to do to the firstborn son? She wanted him. God wanted Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, to give Isaac up as a sacrifice, right? And obviously Abraham goes to the top of the mountain and tries to do it until God stops him and says, no, 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 you have done well. You have survived my test. You survived my trial. Here, Hannah is doing something similar. She was praying for a firstborn. She was weeping for a firstborn. In her anguish, God listens and gives her the firstborn son. And here she brings her son with the pieces of an offering. It mentioned in verse 24 that she brought three bowls, one out of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought them to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. Those are all items that you bring for an offering and for a sacrifice. And Hannah came back with nothing. Right? She left all those pieces there at the sanctuary. She left them there for God. In this moment, Hannah, just like Abraham, is offering her only son, Samuel, as an offering. As a gift that she returns to God. It's an interesting symbolism that we can see between these two of what's going on. But her making this decision to keep the child there, to make this promise of what she said to God, is a, is a clear sign of obedience. But there's something much bigger than the fact that she left her child there, that she gave it into the hands of Eli. One of the most important things here is that she is following the will of God and she's doing it for the best intent of the child. Today, church, I am not telling you to leave your children here at church. I am not telling you that it is a better deal for you to leave your kid in an orphanage because they might have a better life in a different family. I'm not trying to say that at all. What I am saying is that Hannah realized that she wanted this kid to have a relationship with God. She wanted, Hannah wanted her son 
to be connected to the Lord. The Lord gave it to her, and she gives it back to the Lord, that the Lord may use this child to the best of her ability. She gives this child the best opportunity to live the best life that he can. And if you look at Samuel's life, he lived a phenomenal life. He was a prophet of the Lord. He served the Lord all the days of his life and was in the throne room with kings. He was there in the front, in the footsteps of the castle, helping make major decisions for the nation of Israel. And it happened because she gave the child to God. It's not that we, that we read this story and say, Oh, I must abandon my child, or I must just give it to the Lord and just leave him there. The idea here is that we train a child to have a relationship with God that as they grow up, they have an actual connection to the Father. They actually get to have a relationship with Him. That this idea of letting the kid be trained, letting the kid learn and nurture and having that experience and exposure can give them a wonderful opportunity. That's what makes Hannah a mother. It's not, it's not because she ditched it. It's not because she left him alone. It's that she gave the child an opportunity for the best life by having a relationship with God. Today, I want to call out to our mothers. Because mothers make incredible sacrifices for our children. We make sacrifices physically. You know, I can tell multiple stories of my mother physically having to drive somewhere to pick me up, to drop me off, to pick me up again, to take me to the next place. I, you know, my mom wants to cook a meal, but all I want is cheese pizza. So she has to go somewhere else to go find cheese pizza so that I can stop crying. But there's a physical taxing of raising a child. Mothers suffer financially by making hard decisions of putting kids through school, putting kids, of buying clothes because they no longer fit. You've got to get new clothes for your kid every like six months. Like when I went from like a size six to a size 12 uh, between sixth grade and eighth grade. That's a lot of shoes. And I bought a lot of them during recess. Like physically, financially, emotionally. Like, you have a kid that is right there in your face wanting to be somewhere, be with you, be there all the time. You want a moment to breathe, to relax, to step away from it. You can't because the kid's still there and the kid's about to do something that's going to hurt itself for life. And so you have to be constantly, like, watching and observing and making sure that your kid is not about to send himself to the funeral home 50 years early. Like, you're watching over this kid every single morning. It is physically, financially, emotionally, and sometimes spiritually draining to raise children. But all of you put in a tremendous sacrifice for your kid to have a better life. To have a warmer experience in that in some way they may learn about God. Hannah realizes that she can't teach the child about God by herself. She brings the child in so that the child can learn about God and to be used by God. Today, I don't expect mothers and fathers to raise the child and teach it the way to go with God by themselves. That's why we have a community. We invite you to bring your children to our schools, to bring them here to church, to bring them here into this community, that they can learn more about God and that we as parents work together in a community to raise our children in the way that they should go. So, mothers, parents, just as Hannah prayed for her son and promised to give him to the Lord, we also need to give our children to God. To put our child in God's hands. 
to let God lead them and to mold them into men and women of God. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much again for this day and for this topic and this sermon. I pray, Lord, that you be with us and help us as we raise our kids for a brighter tomorrow, that they may be used by you and that they may be a witnesses and spokesmen of you uh, in their own life and in their own time. I pray, Father, that you be with each of us in a special way. Watch over us and bless us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.